Okay, I think we're on it. All right, everybody, hello and welcome uh, to webinar over vineyard diseases. Today we have Ms. Sarah Wallace presenting. She is a plant pathologist here at Oklahoma State University and does a lot with our vineyards and grape sampling. And so uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Sarah. Thank you, Ann, for that introduction. For those of you who may not know me, I have uh, just a quick background slide. Um, I did start out with um, parents that did not grow anything. And um, I had a neighbor growing up who was the home ec coordinator for our county. And so my first understanding of plants was planting by the thousands of tulips for them to be beautiful in the spring and then for us to dig them back up again. We were in Virginia. Um, and then when I was a paramedic, when I was around age 20, um, my, my grandmother had a heart attack and she, I went to visit her at the hospital and she gave me a park seed magazine and encouraged me to grow plants. And she had beautiful gardens. And so I do feel like sometimes it skips a generation. <laughs> so that if you may not be very good at it uh, or if somebody else, you, your parents, you didn't grow up around agriculture or growing plants, um, it's okay, you can learn. And so I uh, started with just some like a little herb garden outside my back door in a townhouse. And then we moved to a house and I learned that you could grow and buy um, bare root plants and they would plant them and they would just be beautiful. And then I found edibles. Uh, and then we moved to a 25 acre property um, outside of Fredericksburg, Virginia. And so that was kind of like my horticulture playground. Um, I had grapes, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, and a um, 100 foot by 100 foot vegetable garden. And then I started sharing with people how you could grow a lot of your own food and took a landscape design class through the mail because it was back in uh, early 2000s. And then uh, we moved to Tulsa in 2010. And I planted this community garden that is right here by Aaron's um, picture on my screen, at least. And I was having, when I planted fruit trees, I didn't want to take care of the grass underneath. And so I planted um, pumpkins and watermelons. Well, I had watermelons coming out of the wazoo and um, I shared them with the um, class at the YMCA. And they're like, oh, you know how to grow things? Can you help us with our community garden? So that was my first step in learning how to teach others how to grow plants and how to teach it in actually an official capacity. And so we did a 12 week class and expanded their community garden. And I learned about access. One of the guys in my class had been hurt at work and was using a cane and he could not get down in the ground to plant things. So we um, use raised beds. Um, then I moved to Stillwater to finish my degree. I started at Tulsa Community College in horticulture and then um, came over to Stillwater to finish my horticulture degree. And I actually got paid to do all the things that I had been doing before. I managed the vegetables, the small fruit, and the fruit trees, at, um, including the grapes, at the Botanic Garden. While doing that, I came into water on the weekends and found issues with the plants. Um, and then my boss, Kim, at the time would say, hey, take a cutting of that and take it to Jen at the lab. And after doing that a few times, uh, Jen one day said, hey, did you know there's such thing as plant pathology? Um, you're really good at it. <laughs> and so I, once I graduated, I was offered a master's in agricultural biosecurity, where I actually studied pythium and ornamentals and diseases of grapes in Oklahoma. So there are typically biotic and abiotic causes of plant diseases um, in general. Abiotic are our non-infectious ones, so typically non-living or environmental factors, uh, such as freeze damage, whether it be on grapes or pears. And then we have the biotic or living organisms and pathogens. And so we are, most of us are probably familiar with black rot. This is what it looks like on the leaves. Um, and I think recognizing it on the leaf first is key. Um, to then saying that these actually will spread to your fruit. So let's start with abiotic causes. We off, I went through our database for the last two years and saw, okay, what have we seen in grapevines? Um, and so we've had some phytotoxicities. Sometimes certain chemicals um, and certain varieties of our grapes are more sensitive to certain chemicals. And then oils are oftentimes a really big problem in Oklahoma. People want to spray neem or other organic methods, but these are oftentimes oil-based and in our hot sun and our high temperatures, burn the crap out of the leaves. And so that is one thing we just have to be aware of, really watch those temperatures um, and really spray um, on cloudy days and try to um, spray early morning or late evening. 
freeze damage. Um, if you've been growing grapes here for a while, you know that sometimes they can freeze back to the ground. I have a muscadine and two other grapes and they both throws into the ground and just started over. And then chemical injury. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but grapes are one month are sensitive to one one thousandth the dose of 2,4-D. So any kind of drift with 2,4-D can just be super um, killing actually of grapes. But here on the right um, and on the um, middle are grapes that have been, had drift damage from dicamba. This is a classic cupping, almost makes a little bowl out of the leaves. And as you can see, the leaves around them have some weird um, texturing to the, it doesn't look like a normal grape leaf, but it's not actually cupping. So that depends on what stage the leaves are growing out when the damage actually occurred. We cannot test for this at um, the lab, but ODAP actually lab can test for pesticide injury or herbicide injury. And then this is actually glyphosate injury. These on the left are um, more of like a fan-like elongation of a leaf. And if I had not seen it on a grape vine, I would not even know that that's a grape leaf. You can see the grapes in the back. So obviously at a certain type of the growth, um, this is when the drift occurred. And I know about this plant because it's Jen's plant and she has um, grapes on a fence and her neighbor likes to spray glyphosate um, at the base of the fence so it doesn't have to weed it against the fence. So these regularly have drift throughout the year, but oftentimes continue to produce, as you can see, and actually um, outgrow this. So there are five primary types of plant pathogens, but we're just gonna talk about fungi, bacteria, and viruses as they um, work on grapes. So fungi typically start as spots and blotches on the leaves. And this is brown or necrotic spots. I think of it as a pencil eraser, kind of um, stamping across the backside of the leaf. And then when you review that under magnification or with a hand lens, you can actually see the fruiting bodies of the fungus. These are the black uh, fruiting structures that when it has the right temperatures and the right conditions, the spores of the fungus will come out and spread the disease to new leaves and grape the actual fruit. So this is what it looks like on the fruit. It's by a mid-infection. And then this is what it looks like end of season end of season, and where the grapes have already been harvested. These are left hanging in the canopy. And unfortunately, these mummies can host the spores for next year's infection. So that's why it's key to understand how the fungi work in the system. And then what can we do about that? So fungi disperse through wind, splash, runoff water, insects can move them around contaminated tools, and plant propagation. During my master's, I found that plant propagation was one of the main ways that we spread the um, diseases in Oklahoma. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> I saw this up on Facebook this week, <coughs> talking about selling grapevines here in Oklahoma. So I contacted them and asked if they'd want to be in our survey, but also wanted to know their history and if they get these vines tested. Because we all know that grapes are really easy to root and grow. And actually when I taught a class for Becky Carroll, the introduction to the grape class, my introduction was, if you came over to my house, I would um, show you my new grapes that I got I would cut a piece off and give it to you and you can take it home and root it. <laughs> but the problem is within a year or two, you would find out that I shared a pathogen or two with you. And then what we have insects that can spread that around in your vineyard. So when it's not intentional, it is definitely by accident, but that is one of the, the most common ways as plant propagation, how we spread these diseases around. So fungi reproduce through spores and infectious propagules because their purpose is to disperse and survive during unfavorable periods. This is tan spot on a wheat leaf, but this is just how it works. And if you pick that leaf and you put it in a baggie overnight, the moisture in the leaf itself will actually cause the spores to germinate like little seeds. 
And then you have the white body, the fungus, which is the mycelia. What's important to know is that fungi can infect directly or indirectly through wounds and natural openings or directly when spores or infectious propagules are on or near a plant. They can germinate and directly penetrate the plant when in presence of high humidity or moisture for long periods. This is what causes our infections. So when we have long dry periods, we typically don't have many fungal problems. But when we overhead water our own plants, or when we have long periods of like 24 hour rain periods for rain events, sometimes it can even be six hours, they can actually cause these infections to occur. <coughs> well, during our survey, a few of us went out into the field and did some sampling. And I came across this vineyard in August and I was floored at the amount of canopy they had. And as we got closer, and actually move the vines, they had tons of leaf hoppers and lots of hanging mummies from black rot. And so it is very easy to overwater and get way too much canopy, which then holds in that high humidity, allowing the berries and the um, fungal spores to just grow and multiply inside that moisture of that canopy. They can also splash transmit so if um, we have a rain event and you already have an infection on the leaves, it can move right next door to the next plant or on the next uh, cordon. Other fungi that we can also address are like downy mildew, powdery mildew, and anthracnose and phomopsis. All of these typically start on the leaves and then move to the fruit. But what's, what's cool about what I was reading is that oftentimes a fungicide program and a regular spray program can um, cover almost all of these. And it's important to rotate them so that we don't get resistance to the fung fungicides. So with most pathogens, we're gonna try to plant resistant plants if possible, reducing leaf wetness, lowering humidity, and increasing air circulation, like managing that canopy, increasing the plant diversity, I wouldn't go with one variety. Um, removing and discarding disease material, uh, cleaning tools, and the use of fungicides. But the key thing with fungicides is understanding that they are preventative and they go on before a rain event, not curative. 99% of fungicides are a protective covering on the leaf surface or on the, on the fruit surface so that the fungi cannot penetrate the leaf and or the berries to cause the infection. So it's not after we already have an infection started, it's actually preventative. Bacteria, they produce quickly and bacterial diseases progress rapidly when conditions are favorable, typically 60 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit and um, 60 to 80% humidity. The binary fission is where the bacterial cells get bigger and divide in half. Therefore, bacterial infections can get pretty bad pretty fast. These can also disperse the same ways but oftentimes there are contaminated tools. Um, crown gall is a common pathogen found in vineyards, typically at the base of plants. Um, it can also be on the roots or the trunk, um, and it can be spread when you're pruning it out to on your pruning tools. This is actually a rose plant at a nursery, but it's the same similar idea. The main bacteria that we fight um, is the crown gall, but my, more importantly is Pierce's disease. This is uh, caused by the bacteria Xylella fastidiosa. Um, this causes scorched leaves. Um, it oftentimes drops the leaves that holds the petiole. So you'll have a very interesting look um, and gradual dieback of the vines. It isn't transmitted through infected plant material and insects. So the management is recommended to remove the infected plants and scout for xylem feeding insects with yellow sticky cards. And there's actually a fact sheet just on this, which I took this picture from. And this is a low incidence in Oklahoma. It's just more of an awareness. And if you have something like this, definitely get it tested at the lab. It is free for up to 10 samples per year per person. And so it just gives you the information that you need. Um, it's better to test than guess. Viruses are our last and smallest group of plant pathogens. They're often carried by insects from plant to plant, and they are our most common pathogen in Oklahoma. These can infect indirectly through wounds and natural openings. 
They can be moved around by plant propagation, infected seed or mechanical through grafting or pruning. Um, and arthropods, unfortunately, are one of our main uh, mechanisms for moving them around in our vineyards. Um, mites, leafhoppers, treehoppers, and mealybugs are our primary problems. Um, it sort of happens like this though. This is actually a watermelon with a watermelon mosaic virus. But when you actually see the symptoms on the leaves and the fruit, the insect came by with a virus like two weeks ago. So there's not really anything we can do with either insecticides or fungicides, and there are no viricides. Um, so it's removing that plant and not saving the seed. Because if you keep the plant there, new insects can move in, they can feed on that plant, get the infection, and then spread it to the rest of your plants. Viruses oftentimes show model and mosaic. This is a great plant um, that has um, this green, the multiple greens are, are the mosaic um, and the texture and the curling is more of the model. So it's not like a flat, normal looking leaf. And then here on um, the right, we have flower and leaf distortion due to rose rosette. These are the normal rose leaves in the background. And then uh, this is off of one cane it has multiple, sometimes hundreds of flowers and these really weird elongated leaves that don't look anything like the actual parent plant. And what this does is it steals all of the energy from the plant into overproducing, overproducing, overproducing all these blooms and leaves in one area. So for viruses, there's really no cure for plants in the field or landscape. Um, fungicides and bactericides are not effective. Insecticides may prevent the spread of viruses transmitted by insects. Um, if you already know that there is a virus, we're looking for resistant plants when available. And then removing and destroying symptomatic plants is really key, not keeping them around to get reinfected by the insects and then, then move it around. So in 2008 was the first time we had a case of Pierce's disease caused by a bacteria. Um, it was found in grapes in Oklahoma. Then in 2014, we had a sample, a grape sample that came into the lab with red blotches early in the season and leaf curl, but it tested negative to grapevine leaf roll viruses. And then in 2015, we had more samples that came in with red blotch symptoms that tested negative to the grapevine leaf roll viruses. And so in 2015, they actually got onto the farm bill and got money to actually do the cooperative agricultural pest survey for 2016 and 17. And so that is actually what I did my master's on, but USDA pays for these um, statewide surveys to be done so that um, USDA, their first line of defense is at the ports where they um, test and check incoming plant material to the country. And then if something happens or if they are concerned about it, then they can do surveys in each state for new pests or pathogens. So in 2017, we tested for the grapevine red blotch virus, um, grapevine leaf roll associated virus, there's actually nine, but we tested for the primary ones, one and three and four plus, xylella, which is Pierce's disease, phytoplasmas, there's a couple of different ones from Europe that we do not want and currently don't have in the US, and rot runner, which is a fungal disease found in Europe in cool or wet areas. So in 2016, we surveyed 15 vineyards in 13 counties and tested the first five of those tested. And then in 2017, we tested 16 vineyards and 14 counties and we included the rot runner. It's very time consuming. And so then I was their student and was able to do it for them. So what we get in is a grape sample, multiple leaves with the petioles preferably. And then we cut it up and put it into two different types of bags. And then we cut the petioles and put them in a tube here because it adds a chemical and it has to be boiled. And then those petioles have to be cut up and looked at underneath the microscope. So we do three different uh, main um, tests with the DNA extraction, then the RNA extraction and the petioles. If any of you have had a COVID test recently, if you go to the doctors, they're using real-time PCR. And so we're actually doing real-time PCR for the phytoplasmas here on the bottom. When I do the petioles, I actually have to slice them after they've been uh, boiled in a chemical and then cooled. And then I look at them underneath the microscope. And what I'm looking for is this xylem 
looks like a really long spring and it should be clear the fungus actually makes a sine wave in the xylem when you have an infection. And so I did 96 samples in 2017 and I've done 115 samples now this year in the last couple months and we haven't ever found it. So what's really key for you guys to understand is what the different vectors are and how, what should I be looking for in the vineyard? So grapevine red blotch virus is vectored by the three-cornered alfalfa tree hopper. Um, we're still looking on to if oftentimes there's a vineyard located near alfalfa fields, that are these tree hoppers there. And then when they are harvesting the alfalfa, they move over to the vineyard. Um, grapevine leaf roll associated virus is oftentimes moved around by mealybugs and soft scale. Cybella fastidiosa, which is our bacteria, can be moved around by sharpshooters, spittle bugs, and cicadas. The phytoplasmas can also be moved around by plant hoppers, leaf hoppers, and aphids. And the rot brenner is um, moved around by rain splash, water movement, and dust. It's so fine that it can be in the soil and then moved around as dust. So I'm going to go through these. Um, grapevine red blotch virus is our main concern. This is the one that causes red blotching between the veins and smaller cluster of grapes in this picture here. And then this has red veins on the lower side of the leaf. The biggest issue with this one is it is a slow decline of the plant, but that the fruit does not mature at the same time. So in diseased plants, you're gonna have um, berries that have not even gotten to raisin yet and berries that are completely ripe getting rotted. And so when you harvest those clusters, they are very off flavors because you have the tannins from the non-ripe, not even colored berries yet, all the way up to overripe um, high bricks berries. Unfortunately, this little guy is our um, vector. He is common in Oklahoma. I actually took a picture of one on a sunflower in my backyard in 2017 and didn't even know that it was going to be my insect vector for this disease. So in 2016 and 17, we surveyed um, these counties and then we found grapevine red blotch in the yellow counties. And at least at this time in 2017 and 18 when we published this data, the purple counties were not positive. So the biggest issue with grapevine red blotch is here. So these clusters are ready to be harvested by date and time. But as you can see on the um, clusters, there are overripe almost raisins here, ripe ones, and then all the way back to young, not even yet colored green ones on the same um, cluster. Our next um, one is, and for this one, what we're recommending for grapevine red blotch is removal, because this one is the one that is going to spread through your vineyard because we do have the insect vectors and this is the one that's going to really mess up the, the fruit and the vine flavor. I mean, I'm sorry, the fruit flavor and um, it may slowly live, but it's gonna definitely uh, affect production. Now grapevine leaf roll viruses are a little bit different. They are still affecting the plant and production, but they are not affecting the fruit quality. And so it's just going to be more of like maybe a 10 year decline versus a, um, an immediate decline in the fruit quality and the fruit like the red blotch. So these are typically all in the same genus of viruses spread by mealybugs. Some of them are graft transmitted, but the main issue is people and shared plant material. And um, that is the biggest thing that I want you guys to learn and know just for your own safety and for your own awareness that we can actually unfortunately get plants um, and they be infected. So these are the mealybugs and I was reading about this this week but the, they found that a female can test positive and her eggs are not positive but they the first and second instars that are the most mobile and the most they're so tiny they can blow around in the wind they are hope they are acquiring the virus from the plants and then spreading it to other nearby plants. And so the biggest issue they talked about with this is if you have grapevine leaf roll viruses, 
then do not plant new vineyards or new blocks of vineyards or vines near the infected ones because in multiple different countries, they have shown that the mealybugs are so mobile that they will get and quickly infect those new um, vines. There are some um, beneficial insects that actually feed on those young instars and the adults of mealybugs. Um, there's a mealybug destroyer and there are some other different um, beneficials. The issue is that for treating for the um, insects, we would also be killing the beneficials. So trying to find an IPM or an integrative pest management that we could use both the, the, the um, beneficial insects. And so what I've read and found um, has worked pretty well is making sure that you have the insectary and the nectary for the insects, for your good guys. So you wanna be able to have a food source for them and a breeding source for them. So that they will stay around in your vineyard or in the nearby area. And so when they actually have the mealybugs come in, then they will actually pounce on them and eat them immediately. So the populations will not get out of control. Oftentimes we think of beneficials as, oh, I have a problem, let me order these. But it really is having them on hand and having them have a food source and a life source or a place to live. And then when the bad guys come in, then they're a food source and populations don't get out of control. So here's a quick um, summary just to show the difference between red blotch and leaf roll and Cabernet Franc. So red blotch has flat margins here on the upper left. And then red blotch has pink veins typically. And with leaf roll, you typically have leaf rolling margins that roll downward or I say backward, depending on which the leaf is facing. And then it typically has green veins. But we do test for both of these. Um, and so if it is not clear, or sometimes you can see both symptoms in the same plant and they may test positive for both, you can feel free to let us test it for you. So it is important to monitor, um, to walk through the vineyard regularly, looking for reddish leaves, looking for curling leaves. It's important to have these sticky cards. They recommend a yellow three by five clip to the upper vine support um, around the perimeter and then also diagonal through the vineyard. And then you can see what insects are currently there. So in our lab, we actually do do um, insect diagnostics and have a person actually just for that. And so um, if Aaron doesn't recognize them or if you don't know, feel free to email us a picture or you can actually email us the sticky card. I can show you how to do that. But there's actually a, um, a whole virtual viticulture academy that talks on when they have a, a fact sheet on yellow sticky traps. So in 2016 and 17, we found that 22% of, I'm sorry, 2017, we had 22% of the leaf roll uh, were positive and 34.38% or 34% had red blotch. Um, and that was a little bit changed, increased a little bit from 2016. And then it decreased a little bit from grapevine red blotch from 2016. Fierce's disease has pretty much stayed around 3% of our um, diseases. Phytoplasmas we did not find, which was great, and rock runner we did not find, which was great. And this year, um, as of last week, when I was working on this presentation, we've had 115 samples. Um, we have had 32 positive for, um, let's see if I can move this, 32 positive for grapevine leaf roll, and 36 positive for red blotch. So it is higher in leaf roll and a little bit lower in red blotch. Um, and then Pierce's disease has stayed around 3%. So that is just something to be aware of and then to be looking for. Thankfully, we did not find phytoplasmas or rot runner, um, which was great. So after I talk about these things, you're like, well, Sarah, how can you even grow grapes in Oklahoma? Because it's, there's so many different factors. So it really is about the pathogens, the host and their environment and how they all overlap. And so that is where we can change the hosts if we can buy disease resistant varieties or better varieties for our area. And then controlling the somewhat of the environment by pruning, um, cleaning and keeping the insects um, either happy and healthy for the beneficials that could then control our, um, our, our bad bugs. So I love this integrated pest management um, pyramid. Um, it just talks about 
what we can do from the cultural sanitation aspect all the way up to the use of pesticides. Um, I understand that you guys are commercial and will need to use pesticides, and that's not a problem, but I teach a class where a lot of people do not like to use pesticides. And so I try to give a lot of options up to that point. We already talked about thinning and pruning for air circulation, choosing resistant plants, putting in the right place, watering the roots, not foliage, removing disease plant material. That even that is really key with the mummies. This time of year, if you're walking or if you're getting thinking about, okay, well, I'm gonna prune here, I'm gonna prune there, or I'm just gonna walk it and look at things, you could be removing those mummies if you find them. Because the less spores that are available to reinfect in the spring, the better. Um, I'd also put down new mulch or whatever ground cover you have underneath, because oftentimes those spores will go down to the um, ground, wait over winter, and then as soon as we have one of those spring rains, splash back up to the foliage and start to restart that infection. Removing disease plants before the disease spreads, we already talked about that for viruses, or mainly for red thought. Um, scouting the vineyard is really key, um, looking for signs of change. Identifying insects, good and bad. Um, if you can, hand pick off the bad. Take a take a bucket of um, or even a um, Eskimo Joe's or some kind of cup with you with soapy water in it, and picking off the bad ones to put in the water. Um, removing infected leaves, oftentimes with a fungus. If we start by removing those infected leaves, they won't splash transmit the fungus to the nearby leaves when we have the next rain. Recognizing good bugs, the predators, and biological controls. I do plant flowers to attract and create habitat for beneficial insects. Um, and I know that some people, I know at Blackberry Farms and some vineyards have roses at the end to know when the fungus is getting out of control and they need to spray. Um, the same thing with flowers. You could put flowers at the end that would attract and create habitat for beneficial insects. And then if needed, apply pesticide early morning or late evening to avoid pollinators. And fungicides are preventative. They have to be applied before the rain. You guys already know this about environmental stress problems. The selection of plant material is key. Proper planting, proper plant maintenance, site disturbance, fertility and soil pH, um, climate for extremes with our heat tolerance and our cold tolerance, and then chemical injury. Prevention, there is a national um, clean plant network for grapes. Um, this is industry that are actually um, testing and supplying grape material for um, uh, vineyards around the nation. Um, and sanitation, keeping them clean then is really key. Controlling the weeds, grass, and insects. Oftentimes our pathogens and our insects can overwinter in green bridges, whether it be grass or nearby weeds or um, outer perimeters. And then they have, um, as soon as the grapevines put out their new leaves, they just move back in and um, take over. So this was one of the vineyards that I visited um, where a grass competition, not just competition for the grapevines, but also really an easy way for aphids or fungi to just hang out down there. And then the next rain we get splash right up to those lower leaves. So I work at the lab here on OSU campus in Stillwater. Uh, Jen Olson is our lab director and our primary plant disease diagnostician. I am the second primary um, plant disease diagnostician and Alex Harmon is our insect diagnostician. And we have two students that currently work with us. Our mission statement is to provide residents in the state of Oklahoma with both accurate diagnosis of plant disease and insect pests and recommendations for their control. And we work year round to help people and to help you be better growers um, and to assist you as needed. But what's interesting to me is that typically when we cut samples that we have on an annual basis, 50 to 85% are abiotic, meaning that there's no pathogens or arthropods present um, and environmental or cultural factors are suspected. And this year, since it was so hot and dry for so long, a lot of our um, samples, we just cannot find anything. Nothing would grow out, no pathogens were there. And then we have 15 to 50% of the time, um, they're abiotic. So we have fungi, viruses, and bacteria nematodes and parasitic plants. So if you do send a sample to us, we would ask that you prevent the soil or potting mix from contacting the foliage. Um, please don't ever add moisture to a sample bag. You can store it in the refrigerator until the shipment or delivery to an extension office. Um, we wanna prevent the samples from being crushed or damaged in transit. So you can put them in a box with there's some stuffing or there's air packs. Um, 
and wrapped from the keeping the um, potting mix or the soil off of the um, leaves, especially if it's for a leaf spot. And then also put those all in a bag so that it will retain their own moisture. But digital images are highly useful. And oftentimes we start with that. Here is another picture of strawberry plants that were just um, wrapped up and then double bagged um, and sent into the lab. So you can start with images. Um, we actually work directly with commercial growers. Um, you can also start with your extension agent, um, but we can email to sick plants um, or got bugs. I also included Aaron in here since he is gonna be your extension um, specialist with the grapes. Um, and I know he always loves getting pictures and can send them to us if he needs clarification and vice versa. Hey, Aaron, have you seen this? You know, we're getting some of these on grapes. So we do have a plant sample submission app. I'm not familiar with enough to know how, I think it's called plant sample submission. <laughs> so and then you select Oklahoma State. And so I added some of these um, resources, um, both on the OSU website, um, the spray guide for the Midwest Fruit um, Pest Management Guide, and then Texas has one. And I think we have many different fact sheets that are on there. You can also contact me at the email if you have questions about this or about the presentation. And with that, I will take questions. All right, cool. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Let me stop the recording and we'll open up to a Q&A.